Hello everyone and welcome to my Yamaha CS60 restoration video. Um, this synth deserves a lot more love than what it gets. It's an absolutely fantastic synth. It has a massive sound for a single oscillator synth. It's just huge. The filters are really special. Um, the ribbon controller is awesome. You'll only ever find that on the CS80 and the CS60. It has a wonderful keyboard with brilliant aftertouch, which you only get from the CS50, except you get a whole extra octave here. It has twice as many voices as the CS50. Now, I really like this synth. It's tremendously expressive and it's just unique. Um, and when you turn the filter up, you don't lose any of the bass frequencies at all. So I consider this one of the really special synths. Unfortunately, the world doesn't, for the most part, agree with me. This synth doesn't get a lot of love. Um, in fact, it's probably most known for being the spare parts for a CS80. This synth's being attacked um, from two sides, really. Internally, the capacitors are dying. It's 40 years old. Um, the electrolyte either drips out or the capacitors just don't work as well anymore because of their equivalent series resistance. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So it's dying on the inside and, and those capacitors then take out the specialist Yamaha chips. And they are so expensive and rare now. And they're really hard to get. And that's why this synth suffers another fate. And as people dive into it to get parts for the CS80. This synth has twice as many voice cards as the CS50. So really, the CS50 gets left alone. The CS80 owners want the 60. So if it's not dying internally, people are killing it. Um, and that does annoy me a little bit because it's an absolutely wonderful synth. And a lot of the CS80 sounds you'll hear on records only use one voice layer anyway. So I'm on a bit of a mission. I want to save it. <laughs> I feel a bit like Saw Guerrero from Rogue One. <laughs> save the 60s, save the dream. <laughs> um, so I'm going to show you how to fully restore one. It's a huge job. It's not for the lighthearted. Um, I consider it probably tougher than the memory MOOC. Um, in some ways, because you can't pull the boards out easily at all, because it's all soldered point to point. Our mission here is to restore the power supply. The power supply, the capacitors in it will be dead. It won't be working that well. There are plenty of electrolytics in here on the voice cards and the other boards as well, and those capacitors need to go. Um, there's one tantalum capacitor in the CS60. That needs to go. Um, once we've done that, it's a lot safer. I will show you also how to calibrate the power supply. We won't do that in circuit because you don't want to risk blowing up the rare Yamaha chips. There's a trick to that though. You need to short out some pins on the power supply or it won't work once it's unplugged. Um, so I will show you all of that. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so to get the CS60 open, uh, there's actually only four screws, which is good. So at the end of the keyboard, um, there's a screw that drops down from the front. Just loosen that and sort of drops down a little bit. Um, and about a hand width behind that one, so about that far underneath the side, there's another two screws for the top panel. Um, this is quite a heavy synth, so getting those two screws out can be difficult. It's about 50 kilograms, um, so I struggle to lift it. Uh, even up onto one end. <laughs> so um, getting those screws out, uh, if you don't have access underneath, is quite difficult. I've built a stand that just has uh, metal bars. So I can get in between the metal bars to get the screws out. And there is that screw for that side. So that's not so much of a big deal for me. Um, you may need to work out some sort of stand that gives you access to the screws. But once they're done, it's not too difficult. Uh, now the panel will lift up. Uh, I may need two hands to do it though, because it's quite difficult to do with one hand. There's nowhere to grip it. Okay, got it. Right, so I'll just lift up. And the good thing about the CS60 is the stabilizer bar engages itself, so it stays up and it won't fall back down on you. Uh, and for the keyboard, it's basically the same. There's nowhere to grip the keyboard though. 
uh, it's quite difficult. So uh, the easiest place is under the keys, but if you use only one key, there's a chance you can break it. As you can see, someone's already broken this key. So um, full hand underneath and then lift up. And again, that um, just sits nicely in position. Right, so before we start, let me tell you a story. Um, this synth was pretty much the only Yamaha that has entered my house still in a working condition. I went and checked it out and made sure that it was fully operational um, before I decided to buy it. So this is my synth. And uh, I didn't want to buy a CS60 with a whole lot of dead Yamaha chips that are really, really rare and no one can get again. Um, so I made sure it was just fine. And when I got home, um, I decided to be, take a really conservative approach and not turn it on until I'd done all the things like basic recapping, gotten rid of all the tantalums, calibrated the power supply, all that kind of stuff. But by the time I'd finished that, all the CMOS chips in this synth were dead. Um, and that I found that quite astonishing because I've been working with CMOS for a long time and I have ground points all over this room that I constantly ground myself on to make sure I don't kill CMOS chips. Um, but then I had a bit of a think about it, and this synth is quite different. This synth is almost entirely made of wood. There's nowhere for voltage to go besides in the circuit where the chips are. Have a look at how the top panel um, is made. It, it's kind of hard to believe actually, it's entirely wood and all of the components are screwed in with wood screws. And the bottom is the same as well, the boat is wood. Um, and these sides here are wood and look, it looks like metal doesn't it? But when you lift up underneath, you can see that it's actually wood and it's just a hard coating on the top that's painted. So if you walk across the room generating a lot of static electricity and you touch the sides of this synth, you're not going to dissipate that electricity throughout the case. Um, and that's sort of, it's a real advantage for a lot of the metal synths um, because they contain so much metal that, that when you touch them, the static electricity dissipates throughout that volume of metal and the voltage is reduced to basically zero. Because it, the thing about static is that there's not much current. There's a lot of voltage, but there's very, very little current. So as soon as you touch something, that charge disperses to nothing. I mean, you could do it with just a screwdriver. You could, you could remove the charge from you. But this synth, that doesn't happen. Um, so it's all wood. That means you've still got that static on you when you touch the circuit. And what makes it even worse <laughs> is that these big rails along here, they look like grounding points, like they would go to earth, like you could dissipate charge through them, but you can't because they're actually in the circuit. These are the power rails. This bottom metal rail here is zero volts and the top is actually plus 15. So touching anywhere here, you're gonna move that static from your hand into the chips. So wow, it's very different to normal um, synthesizers also. Um, when you get a synth that hasn't been serviced before, chances are it will have the original CMOS chips in there. Um, and the, the CMOS chips from the 1970s, they were really, really sensitive to static and they died really easily. So it's kind of a perfect storm. Um, now that I've replaced all the CMOS chips to get the synth working again, um, it's actually fine. I can touch here now and the CMOS chips won't die because it has the new ones in and the new ones are so much more robust um, to the point where you almost become complacent uh, like I did. Um, so there you go. <laughs> um, this, this synth is really, really sensitive to static when the original CMOS chips are still in. So uh, to get it up and working again, you can see that I've already replaced the CMOS logic on the, the KAS board and the sample and hold board and the other board is that special filter board in there so there's some logic in there as well and they're all CMOS so they've been replaced with the new CMOS now um, and the synth is perfectly fine again and in fact it's much more robust now with those new CMOS in there so I'm not going to go through replacing all those CMOS in this video I've done it in a few other videos 
but I just wanted to mention uh, how sensitive this synth was. It's kind of, I'm still astonished that it's entirely made of wood. No wonder they're so heavy. Ha! So let's do the overview. We'll start underneath the keyboard. Um, now in the Yamahas, the keyboard matrix is quite different uh, to most other synths in that um, the matrix is determined by the octave. So it's actually a 12 note um, matrix. So a 12 by five in this case. Um, in most other synths, uh, they just count the number of keys uh, and divide it by eight. So it's mostly an eight by four or an eight by five or eight by six. Um, but Yamaha use it per octave. And the reason why is because of these um, specialist Yamaha chips. So this uh, first one up here, the YM266, so that's the key assigner. And that determines what note in the octave is being assigned. So from A to G sharp. And then separately, which octave that note comes from. So instead of being just a plain mathematical matrix, it's actually based on a musical scale. Now, once it has that information, it does two things. One is that it determines um, whether keys have been pressed off and on, so timing wise, and it sends that to the sample and hold board to open the gates to hold the voltages for each channel. And the second thing it does, it sends the note information to the YM267. <clears throat> And that note information then is turned into a voltage by this chip. So this is a digital to analog converter chip. And it uses other things like it, in, it takes into account the, the tuning pot on the front and the state of the portamento and things like that. And then it generates the voltage to send into the capacitors of the sample and hold circuit, which the YM266 has just opened and closed depending on which key is being pressed. So the two chips work together to control the sample and hold board. That's the, their most basic function. <clears throat> now, after that, this note information also goes somewhere else. And this is where it gets really, really interesting. So, we've finished under the keyboard. Let's put that down gently. And we're into the voice cards. Now, the most amazing thing is there's a big difference between the CS50 and the CS60 and I didn't realize until I found out what these boards do because there was one board that I couldn't figure out what was going on. It was just this really odd board. It has the same YM267 chip on it. Can, can you see the white IC in there? So we've already converted the key presses into voltages. So we shouldn't need to do it again. What happens normally in a synth, and in the case of the CS50, the control voltages go out to do the key notes, and then a copy of them is sent out to the filters to do the filter tracking. And this is the same in almost all other synths except the CS80 and the CS60. So that control voltage then goes to do the key tracking, which is your one volt per octave, and then you can taper that down to get less than one volt per octave. Um, and everyone's happy, and it's brilliant. But the CS60 and the CS80 have more than one filter tracking slope across the keyboard. So if we have a look at the keyboard, so mostly you would have uh, low voltages at low keys, higher voltages at the high keys. And so that would control the pitch and it would control the tracking of the filter. So the two were synchronized. Now, the CS60 has two slopes across the keyboard to control the filter tracking. So it's not just this slope, you've also got a reverse slope. So if you think of the keyboard as being split halfway, you've got a slope at the top half, which could be positive or negative for the filter tracking, and you've got a separate independent slope for the lower half, which could be positive or negative. So you could have filter tracking slopes across the keyboard which go from high, low, high, like a smiley face, and you can have a frowny face, and you can have it going from high to low or low to high, 
or you can have a flat low end with a positive or negative high end, or you can have positive or negative low end with a flat high end. So there's so many different options for the filter tracking. And I can't tell you how awesome it sounds to just open up the bass frequencies a little bit with a little bit higher um, filter frequency. And you can't do that with any other synth besides the CS80. And that is all to do with that one circuit board. It has a lot of calculations to do. It has to calculate where the keys are on the circuit board. So with each voice, because remember, when you're pressing down different keys, voices could swap from one end of the keyboard to the other. So it needs to know which end they are, how far are they away, like um, in the slope, how far are they into the slope, um, and then calculate the timing as well separately to, for each of the eight voices. So there's a lot to do, and that's why there's an entirely separate board that does that. And I've had a look in the CS50 service manual and that board isn't even there. So that's awesome. That's a huge difference and um, explains why there's an entire another digital to analog converter to um, control that. Okay, so for the next boards in line here, there's the eight voice cards here. You can tell those ones because they've got the trim pots on them. So there's the eight voices. So next to our uh, filter cutoff card, we've got the sub oscillator. Now that's not a sub oscillator that tracks the VCOs, that's Yamaha's version of an LFO, so back in the mid 1970s Yamaha labelled the LFO sub oscillator because it was a lower frequency than the VCOs, but now the accepted terminology is a, an LFO, a low frequency oscillator. And then you've got these cards here which control uh, the presets and how they're applied and I'm very interested about those cards because I want to be able to, to develop some really nice presets myself and change the resistors on these cards um, to change what the buttons do on the front so every time you press one of these um, tone selector buttons you dial up a different set of resistors here so that's pretty cool um, and the last card over here is the um, the VCA and at the VCA stage is where the ring mod is applied. Um, so that's pretty cool too. So it has the ring mod on that board. And that's its own separate oscillator, the, the ring mod. Right, so now we've done the overview, the next thing uh, is to start doing some work on it. So we're going to take out the power supply uh, and uh, show you how to pull it apart to get to the caps and then show you how to calibrate it as well. Um, that's not in the circuit um, because you don't want to calibrate it in the circuit when you first do it. So we've got two cables here. This is the voltage input cable and this is the output cable. Now when you unplug the output cable, if you turn the supply on, chances are the negative and positive 15 rails will die and that's because the voltage sense actually comes out and then returns and I'll explain that by looking at the schematic. So you need to have that plug in to turn it on or you need to short out some pins and I'll show you how to do that. Right, so to get the power supply out, first there's those two plugs at the front that you need to unplug. Then the whole power supply sits on a metal plate and there's six screws, three on each side that you need to undo. Then I lift the power supply up and put it on this little container here which um, hides the cable. And then once I've got it up there, I can get to this um, ground cable and unscrew it from the bottom. So you can see the ground um, cable is underneath. And lastly, the main ground wire, which goes to the mains input. So it's pretty obvious that the power should be off when you do this. In fact, I completely unplug the cable to make sure that I know that it's off. So now the power supply is free to move. And that's pretty heavy. Before we pull the power supply apart, I thought I'd explain how it works, because this is a really great supply. Um, it's really simple, just used as an op amp and uh, some big transistors. So it can supply a lot of current and it's quite reliable. Um, and also it's quite different to what we see 
today in synthesizers because it doesn't use those linear regulators. Um, it's not often that we see op amps form the basis of a power supply now. <clears throat> so um, I'll explain this top half. So this is actually one half of the supply. There's another two rails um, for uh, the plus 8.5 and the minus 6.5. So there's another circuit that looks exactly like this. Um, but I'm just going to explain the plus minus 15. And in fact, just concentrate on the plus 15 side. So the basis is that this op amp just compares um, the voltage that it sees to a reference. And we set that up to make sure that we get 15 volts out. So it's the op amp that controls these transistors turning off and on to let more current in or out. Or more current in or less current in. Um, <clears throat> and the mechanism for turning those um, transistors more on or less on is mostly to do with this PNP transistor here. So PNPs, they're actually really cool. They're um, commonly referred to as like a normally on transistor. And the reason for that is, is that if you put some voltage in the emitter, this emitter side's like a forward bias diode. So the voltage just skips across the diode and runs straight into the base. So in a way it charges itself, it turns itself on. So it lets voltage across the emitter into the base, turns itself on and therefore lets voltage out the collector. So in a sense, this transistor is naturally on. And when this is, when voltage comes in here, this transistor is on and provides a lot of current to the bases of these two NPNs, which lets a lot of the voltage or the current through to provide the voltage for this circuit. So in its default state, this part of the circuit would be on. Okay, so that explains how this part of the circuit works. It's basically just a big off and on switch that allows more or less current through to keep the voltage at this point stable. And the control of this big off and on switch comes via the op amp. And the way that's done is, we compare two voltages. So firstly, we need a, a fixed reference voltage that we know is not going to change. So we set that up via a Zener diode. This one's a 5.6 volt Zener diode. And they've also added a standard small signal diode here, which adds to that voltage. So the total here is about 6.25 volts. So what the op amp will do is try and adjust this big off on switch so that it sees 6.25 volts here as well, so that they're balanced. Now, the selection of points of 6.25 volts is just arbitrary. It doesn't matter. You just pick something between 15 and ground. But the point is that the op amp will try and match that on this side by, by turning this switch more on or less on. So this voltage divider is important. We need to set it up so that at 15 volts input, where this line input is going to the op amp, that it's 6.25. So that's the reason behind the choice of these resistors here. So in summary, the op amp changes the output to make sure that this point stays the same as this one by putting in more or less voltage at the top of the divider by supplying more or less current into the circuit. Now, you'll notice that this one, the, the bottom of the divider is referenced to ground. So all we're really controlling here is the plus 15 volts. But have a look at the minus 15 volts. The end of the divider isn't connected to ground. It's connected all the way to the plus 15. And this is what makes a supply really, really cool because the minus 15 will not only track itself, whether it's higher or lower and adjust, it will also adjust when the plus 15 is higher or lower. And what that means is, is that, so you've got um, changes in the plus 15 that go lower, the minus 15 will also go lower to match it. So it's like a mirror image. So when the, there's minor fluctuations in the plus 15, they'll be mirrored with the minus 15. So the supply will go like this. This power supply mostly goes to the op amps. So it's really critical that the op amp receives balanced supply on both sides so that the waveform that it's outputting is centered around zero. If we get one side of this too high, 
that waveform will be biased towards that side. And so we'll now have a DC offset on our waveform. So what this supply does is that it keeps the two supplies in a perfect mirror image that any changes, that waveform stays centered on zero. Now that's brilliant. All the modern supplies now use separate linear regulators for the positive and the negative. So they're all um, regulating in isolation, independent of each other. So the outputs are changing not relative to each other. So you'll get small DC offset issues if anything changes. Whereas this supply synchronizes both, keeping that supply perfectly centered. So all the op amps um, can emit waveforms that are perfectly, um, have no DC offset. Right, let's pull it apart. So the board we need to get to is here. Once we remove this board, um, we can get to the capacitors and replace them. The problem is that board's connected to this um, heat sink. And these are the two uh, transistors that handle the plus 15 volts. So this side's the plus 15 and that side's the minus 15. Um, to get the heat sink off, it's actually underneath. So just make sure I'm not leaning it on a wire or anything. And just the top two screws. Okay, what's those screws around? Um, the circuit board and the heat sink can come free. But then we need to take the circuit board off the heat sink. So there's four screws on the side of the heat sink. Okay. There's only one catch. It's all soldered on. Yes, that's right. Most of the wires in this synthesizer are soldered point to point, and I will show you that when we pull out some circuit boards. But that it actually includes the power supply. There's two plugs on the front of the power supply to take it out of the instrument, but that's the, the only luxury we get. So everything else has to be unsoldered and includes if we want to take this heat sink off. So it does make it easier to get to these capacitors when you remove the heat sink. So when you're looking at the top of the board, the red wires on the left, hopefully it's red on yours too. Uh, <laughs> the yellow wire in the middle and the white right. The white wire is on the right hand side. So here we go, one. Now originally when I took these off, they were actually wrapped around um, the connectors as well as soldered on and I hate that. So it makes it impossible to get them off. So you may have to cut them the first time I think I just heated it up and pulled them out. Um, <clears throat> right, so that's off. And now we can access the circuit board to get underneath. So I think the way I did it was I just rotated the power supply like this, um, held it with some uh, with one of these, a trusty little circuit board holder. And then I was able to get underneath the board and pull the caps off while I had my soldering iron on the top, like this. So that's the best way to do it. And when you're finished, you should end up with a whole pile of old caps that look like this. Now, uh, the new ones, they're actually a lot more efficient. They're a bit smaller, so, but most of them I replaced with the same value, except for the two big ones. I just got the largest value that I could because where they are in the circuit, it's best if we have more filtering, not less, especially in this power supply, because we don't have the advantage of the newer linear regulators, which have better ripple rejection. It's much better that we put the biggest caps in here after the rectifier that we can. And that will get rid of a little bit more of the ripple. But as I said before, this is a brilliant power supply anyway. I'm quite happy with it. Um, so even replacing the capacitors with the same value is fine. So there you go. So the um, assembly is the reverse of what we just did. So I'm going to put it back together now, put it in the synth, and we will do the calibration. Right, so the power supply is back in the synth. 
there's a couple of things to remember. One is the ground cable that screws onto the base. You have to screw it on before you put the power supply back in. Um, and secondly, there's the ground cable that comes out and connects to the main power cable. So you need to not forget that one or else nothing will be grounded. So that just screws in. Now, before we do the calibration, um, Oh, there's a couple of things we need to do. So firstly, we don't want to plug it in to all the boards yet because the power could be all over the place. Um, so we're only going to plug in the cable that comes from the transformer. So this comes from the secondary windings on the transformer. We plug that in. We don't plug in the output cable. Um, there's a problem though, and that's we can't turn the power supply on without the output cable because in the words of the Yamaha service manual, the supply might break. <laughs> so um, we don't want the supply to break, but we also don't want to plug it in when we do the calibration. So let me explain. So this power supply doesn't sense the voltage internally. So normally this output line here would go directly via this divider to the op amp. But in this supply, that doesn't happen. The voltage comes out of the supply goes to the synthesizer, and then this op-amp actually senses the voltage relatively close to the voice cards. So if we unplug this power supply, that voltage sense line gets broken. And so the op-amp doesn't know what the voltage is in the synth. In fact, this comes back as zero because it's grounded. So this whole um, a, a divider here has ground everywhere. So the op amp thinks it's ground, which is too low. So it'll change these um, transistors to be on full. So the voltage that's on this side will be completely transferred to here. And the, uh, so this will be way, 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 way over spec. Um, and these components may not handle it. And that's why um, the Yamaha service manual has a warning about it. So if we're going to uh, calibrate this supply with this part unplugged, we need to short out these pins to make sure that the output comes back and is read by the op amp and that allows us to calibrate it. So we need to short out the positive 15 and the sense line and the negative 15 and its sense line. The easiest way to do that is on the board. Um, the pins are right next to each other so if we just use an alligator clip we can short out the two, they're next to each other and then take those alligator clips to a voltmeter and we can read it from there. Right, so here are my two alligator clips. Uh, the red one at the top is bridging the two top terminals where the brown wires go to. That's the plus 15 and the sense line for the plus 15. Then the terminal directly below those two brown ones has a black wire to it and that's ground. And then just below the one that the black wire goes to, there's another two yellow wires and they're for the minus 15 and the sense line for the minus 15. So they're bridged with a white alligator clip. Now you can't see the colors of the wires very well or where the terminals are because my alligator clips are in the way. But just so that you know, the top two brown are 15, the next one down is ground, and the next two after that, the two yellow ones are negative 15. So at the end of my red alligator clip, we're gonna measure the 15 volts. And at the end of the white one, we'll measure the minus 15. So my multimeter ground is just connected straight to the ground pin that's in between the two. So we can turn it on. And we get, oh, nearly 15 volts, 14.98. Now, the adjustment for the 15 is the first pot in the row, the first trim pot, number one. So if we adjust that, you'll see that change. I'll get it to as close to 15 as I can. There you go. And now I can remove my multimeter um, connection and put it on the minus 15. So there you go, it's on the minus 15 now. And we're getting minus 15 exactly. Yes, I don't have to do anything, that's awesome. So if I did want to adjust it, it's on the second pot in the row. So that's the minus 15 adjustment. But that's good. Oh no, <laughs> I lost my zeros. Oh no, they're back again, good. So after this, um, we've still got the plus 8.5 minus 6.5. And they're on the two connectors that are below these. So 
I'll remove my alligator clips and I'll try and show you where they are. Okay, so here you can see the orange, which is the plus 8.5. Below that we've got green, which is the minus 6.5. And there's a ground right at the bottom that is for the 8.5 and minus 6.5. So your probe now goes on this bottom ground. This top ground's not connected to the 8.5 and 6.5. The top ground is only for the, min for the minus 15 and the plus 15. So it's this bottom ground you need to use now. And we're just measuring the orange and the green. Right, so my probe is on the orange wire now and the bottom ground, so I'm ready to measure the 8.5 volts. And the alligator clips are back shorting out the plus 15 and the sense line and the minus 15 and each sense line. That's because when we turn the power supply back on, that part of the circuit still needs to work. So uh, the plus and minus 15 uh, don't go over range. Okay, so we're ready, switch on. And we're getting 8.5 pretty much, yep. Um, so the trick with the 8.5 is that on the schematic, it's labeled as trim pot number three but on the board, they actually are numbered differently. One, two, three at the back, and then four in the middle. So four is the third one, and three is the last one. So adjusting the 8.5, you would need to use this last trim pot. So now for the minus 6.5. Right, so the probe is now on the green wire. Minus 6.5, one. Pretty close, I'm happy with that. So if I needed to adjust the minus 6.5, remember it is the third one in the row. So the power supply is done, excellent, it's calibrated. Um, so we can plug that huge big output plug, that one, we can plug that output plug back in now and the synth is safe to power on, excellent. So it's time to change some capacitors. Um, I'm going to go from right to left. So I'll start with the VCA board. Um, now, remember, if you haven't got, uh, if you haven't changed your original CMOS chips, uh, remember to strap up because you'll kill them at this point. Or you could do what I did, just kill them. <laughs> and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, so I've got all the new version CMOS in now. Um, so all I'll be doing is touching some metal before I do anything. Um, so I've got a frame that this synth is sitting in and it's made of metal, so I just touch the side of my frame um, before I touch any of the boards. Now once this board is out, it will be by itself then, and it'll be less protected. So I will strap up once I get the board out. Um, a lot of people do work with these boards still in the synthesizer. Um, so you would lift it out and then put down like a, a protective uh, board or something underneath so that you didn't spill solder on all the other boards beneath it. And then you would work with the board like this, just out of the instrument. But I'm actually going to take them all out because um, I'll just find it a little bit easier. And I don't really want... Uh, solder rolling off that board and ending up in other places. So it is a little bit harder than normal uh, because these boards don't unplug. But once you've unsoldered all the wires, it's not too bad. And you can just take a photo so that you remember the order that they all go in. Okay, so the VCA board is out. Uh, it's actually called PRA, which stands for preamp. Um, but it has the VCA and the ring mod on it. Um, so I'm going to replace all the electrolytic capacitors now. Um, be careful on this board, there are two non-polarised ones. So the two big black ones, they're non-polarised electrolytic caps, so make sure you buy the non-polarised versions. All the rest are the standard polarised caps, so just replace them with the same value, which I have just done. So the new capacitors are in, the old capacitors are over there, um, and it's ready to put back in the CS60. And I've started counting out capacitors to put in the voice cards. Um, so I'm nearly there. I think I've nearly got enough to start doing the voice cards. Now, these new capacitors, uh, I'd just like to say a little bit about why we replace uh, the capacitors. Because if you took one of these out from an old synth and you measured it with a multimeter, 
it would have exactly the same capacitance as what it had uh, when it was first put in. So the question is, why do we replace a capacitor that for all intents and purposes looks perfectly fine? The reason is, um, the way these electrolytic capacitors age has nothing to do with the voltage or the capacitance. So those two ratings aren't affected. What is affected though is how fast the capacitor can charge and discharge. So it's something called the equivalent series resistance. So as these capacitors age, their ability to charge and discharge quickly becomes less and less. Now your multimeter is DC. So when you um, test this capacitor, it'll be putting in tiny, tiny little bit of current and waiting a very long time for it to charge. In fact, you can see it on a lot of multimeters. Um, you'll see it's a 50 microfarad, 80 microfarad, 99 microfarad, you know, 100, and then finished. But that's far too slow for an audio circuit. So our multimeters don't really test what we need to test. We need to test how fast can this capacitor charge and discharge. Now the old ones don't do that very well. And so at, when you're at audio frequencies, they can actually not charge or discharge at all because they just don't have enough time. So effectively they can be uh, useless, really, not work at all. And the newer ones, um, they will charge and discharge much, much faster. And so they'll actually do their job at higher frequencies. So the reason why we change them is not because of the capacitance. Uh, you can actually test that uh, with something called an ESR meter. Um, you will get a value and a table and when you measure the capacitors you can tell whether they're dead or not. So there you go. I'm going to put this back in the synth now uh, and then I'll start taking out the voice cards and then I've got a lot more to do. Okay, so the first two boards are out now. Um, I've just put them on some anti-static um, mat because I'm really, really paranoid about the VCOs. I really don't want any of these chips to die, actually, the, the Yamaha chips. So, um, just about ready to start putting in the capacitors on these two boards, but I thought I would show you a little bit about the wiring. So, hang on, touch metal. Uh, the voice cards. So seven and eight go in here. You can see where the, the drilled holes are. And underneath are where all the wiring is. Now, when you first look at it like this, you think, oh my God, where are these wires gonna go? It just doesn't make sense. But it actually does make sense. A great thing about how Yamaha puts things together is that all the wiring looms were done so well. I mean, all these wiring looms end up tied off exactly where the cards are. It's amazing. They must have had a jig where they measured the exact length. So. It's easy to tell uh, the order of the wiring looms because this one must be number seven because the second last and this one over here will be number eight. Now at the end of the day it doesn't really matter whether you swap these around or the voice cards are the wrong way around. Um, they'll still sound, it's just that seven would sound in eighth position. Um, but it's still nice to have them in the right order, especially when you're tuning so you don't get confused. So you just follow where the wiring loom is because it's in the right order. So that's really neat. Much, much better than a uh, synth like the Memory Moog where it's all just spaghetti everywhere. But the downside is, of course, we have to unsolder the boards to take them out. In that case, the Memory Moog is a lot easier to service because you just pull the plugs out. Right, so I've completed one of the boards. You can see the black capacitors that are a smaller size than the big old blue ones. Um, so the capacitors that you'll need to do the voice boards, I might go through just briefly because it'll save you um, trying to figure that out. Um, especially some of them aren't on the schematic, I don't think, some of the larger ones that what most people refer to as decoupling capacitors, although I tend to refer to them as like power storage caps. The big ones that store and buffer the power on the board sometimes don't appear on the schematic because they're not actually connected to anything, they're just connected across the power rails. Um, so there's four of them, they're 100 microfarad. They're just, just polarised, they don't need to be any um, special um, version of electrolytic capacitors, just any old standard one will do. Um, so we've got those four polarised 100 microfarad. 
Now there's lots of non-polarized caps here. So there's five non-polarized one microfarad capacitors, and there's three non-polarized 4.7 microfarad capacitors. There's also two polarized 4.7, so don't get them confused. Three non-polarized, two polarized, both 4.7 microfarad, and last of all, the two tens. So there's two 10 microfarad polarized caps. Once they're all in, the board's pretty much done. So just a quick note for when you're putting the voice cards back in. If you get confused about which wires go where, uh, the service manual makes it really, really clear. In fact, for each voice card, it has a separate color code chart. So it tells you um, what to expect and where to put it. Um, now, basically, they're, they're in the right order anyway, but there's a couple sometimes where you're not quite sure which way they are around. So the manual is really, really great. Um, I just use a metal plate here to protect the other cards when I'm putting these back in. And just make sure you protect the keyboard with something in case you get some splashes. But you shouldn't if you're not using any new solder at this point. That's the main reason why I take this board out and do it over there. Yes, and finally I'm finished. It takes so long. All of the voice cards now have little black ticks on the top, which means I have completed removing all of the old electrolytic caps and putting in new ones. Um, and all the other boards have been done as well. Um, so the only other thing was that there is one tantalum capacitor in this synth. You'll see it, it's blue. It's in the middle of the KAS board. You need to get rid of that. You can just replace tantalums with um, a low leakage electrolytic um, of the same value. And we're quite lucky in the CS60 and that it only has one tantalum capacitor because they're the ones that usually blow up and take out a lot of the Yamaha chips. Um, you can see over here, I've got some that I pulled out of the CS40. You can see the CS40 has many more of those blue tantalums. Now I'm beginning to suspect actually that those tantalum capacitors aren't the main problem. I think it's the electrolytics. It's that um, electrolyte that leaks out of them and the fact that they just don't have the same capacitance anymore, particularly at audio frequencies. And that means there's a whole lot of voltage fluctuations in the synth that in turn blows up the tantalums and the Yamaha chips. So um, you really do have to recap, especially when they're this age and especially if they've never been done before. So it's really important. If we want to keep these synths alive, we really do need to get out those electrolytic capacitors. So um, I think that's it for this one, actually. Um, I, I will need to do the tune, so it's going to have to have oh, it's a fair bit of tuning, actually. Um, that'll be a separate video. But for now, the capacitors are done and it's alive again. <laughs> the aftertouch too. Yeah, in the next um, video, I've got some keys to replace. They're on order now. I'll show you how the aftertouch works, which is awesome. You can kind of see it underneath the keyboard, that little, see that little thing moving there? That's so cool. I've got to show the aftertouch mechanism. Um, yeah, so the next video will be tuning, calibrating, replacing keys and polishing it up. It's going to get the really good clean. I'll spend a lot of time on that pull it apart and clean everything but for now at least it's safe um i hope you enjoyed it and i hope you got something out of it um, and please recap your old yamaha's it's really important thanks <laughs>